presidential election of 2012 was supposed to be a nail biter. So close there would be counting of ballots late into the night. It wasn't. But the campaign did not lack for drama. Between the cast of characters vying for the Republican nomination to the conventions and debates, there was a lot to tweet about. But according to senior Washington Post correspondent Dan Baltz, election 2012 also forever changed the way campaigns would be waged in the future. The book is called Collision 2012, and Dan Baltz joins me in the studio. Dan, welcome. Thank you. So billions of dollars was spent on this campaign. Obama won. The Republicans held control of the House. Democrats still controlled the Senate. They still hate each other. What changed? Well, as you lay it out, I mean, obviously a lot didn't change. This was, in many ways, a very big election, fought out about some very big issues, but fought out in some small ways, as we will probably talk about. And in the end, we got a kind of a status quo result. And I think that the reason for that, Mimi, is that the the red-blue divide in this country, um, we talk about it almost in cliched terms by now. We've heard it so often, and yet... It is a powerful force in our politics, and I think that the, the, the divisions between red and blue probably widened in this campaign, and it's, it's the reason why campaign 2012 did not settle these arguments. We used to think of campaigns as being a place where you had a big debate, you had an argument, and the country voted and the country said, go this direction or that direction. Uh, in this case, even though Barack Obama won a pretty clean victory, the Republicans did hold the House, and people didn't change their views about how they felt about these issues. Did that polarization happen because of the Tea Party? Well, I think the Tea Party exacerbated it, but it's been coming for, for some time. I mean, we, we have been in a, in a polarized environment really throughout the, you know, the, the decade of the 2000s and into 2012. What 2010 did, I think, was move the Republican Party a little bit farther to the right than it had been. The Tea Party influence clearly pushed the Republican presidential candidates to the right. And I think that, that in a sense, widened the gulf between the two parties. I think the other thing that happened in this election, um, or that we could see evidence of in this election, was the passion with which people held their positions. Um, when I would talk to people along the campaign trail and say to a Republican or a Democrat, what's at stake in this election? What happens if, if your candidate loses and the other candidate wins? Armageddon. Armageddon, apocalypse. I mean, they, they thought, in a sense, the world as they knew it or believed it should be would be up, turned upside down. What, um, how do you think elections will be different now after the 2012 election? Well, they'll be different in a number of ways. One is I think that, that uh, because of these divisions, unless there is a way to finally work our way through them, and, and there seems little evidence right now that that's going to happen anytime soon, I think one of the things you will see is this, this, this continued uh, effort to mobilize each party's base as a priority over trying to persuade swing voters. There are very few swing voters left in the country. I mean, it may be, in, in, in a real sense, five, six, seven percent. There was a wonderful moment for me in, in sort of understanding this. Uh, Peter Hart, who's a, a pollster, was conducting a focus group for the Annenberg Public Policy Center at the University of Pennsylvania, and it was done in Virginia, maybe three weeks or so before the election. And the people who had been selected to participate all said they were undecided. There were 10 people. And as Peter went around the room over the course of two hours and talked to them, it was clear that even though 10 said they were undecided, there were only four who were undecided. And so that's one thing. I think the role of super PACs and the amount of money that they raise and spend and the, the influence that they can have uh, is, is significant. The rise uh, of social media, which, mm -hmm. which really came into its own in this election. We saw some signs of it in, in the 2008 election. But in this one, both Facebook and Twitter emerged as powerful forces. The role of debates. Debates created a national conversation which I think in some ways eclipsed a lot of the early campaigning that we had been used to seeing in Iowa and New Hampshire as, as the place where you began to see how the campaign was, was unfolding. The debates changed things. So uh, there are a whole series of, of uh, ways in which this campaign played out. And obviously the, the last one is the role of technology and what the Obama campaign did with the use of technology to enhance their get out the More advanced operation. than the Romney campaign by way, far. Way, way more advanced, yes. 
And it seems that we're, we keep spending more and more money on this. Is that the trend? I think it is. I mean, it, you know, there have been, there've been efforts to limit the amount of money in politics. The public hates the idea that there's so much money spent on these campaigns. And yet every attempt to limit it in some way ultimately has been thwarted or shredded. We did have a system after Watergate that financed partially with public funds the presidential campaign. That's completely gone now. Nobody takes public funds in the primaries, and nobody now takes public funds in the general election. As a result of that, there's an arms race for money, and, and each side you know, goes into this with the fear that the other side will be able to outraise and therefore outspend them. And so there is this mad rush to, uh, to raise and spend money. And again, un- unless there's some new legislation, which is certainly not in the offing, I don't see any turning back on that front. When President Obama was first elected in 2008, he had enormous popularity. Did the Republicans have a strategy of not working with him in order to make him fail? Well, they did have a strategy of not working with him, and this this was put in place almost immediately after he came into office. Obama and his team arrived in Washington in January 2009, I think with this assumption. The, the election had created a sense of goodwill in the country. And even people who had voted for John McCain later said, I actually felt good that we had broken this racial barrier. It made me feel good about, about America. They also knew that because of the economic crisis that we were in a moment when big things had to be done and had to be done quickly. And I think that they believed that the combination of those two would create a climate in which the two parties would be able to work together. But, but that didn't happen. That didn't happen at all. Because it was just, the, I mean, Republic- and, and he says it's an obstructionist Congress. Well, the Republicans decided right away that they were going to oppose almost every major initiative that he put forward. They opposed the stimulus plan. They obviously applo- opposed his health care plan. They opposed the financial regulatory reform plan. There were some smaller things where they worked together. But on those big things, the Republicans decided that the president was going way, way to the left. The president disputes that, obviously. But their view was he was taking the country in a, in a much farther left direction than he had suggested he would do in the campaign. But they also, I think, believed that their route back to power would be to stand in, in the way of what he was trying to do um, and hope that the public would reward them, as they did in 2010. Dan Baltz is in the studio with me. He's a national political correspondent for The Washington Post. His book is called Collision 2012, Obama versus Romney and the Future of Elections in America. But the public still held President Obama responsible for the lack of action in Washington, the failure to get along, the failure to get big things done. And a lot of people in focus groups brought up LBJ and said, well, you know, Lyndon Johnson did it. Why can't you? It was one of the maddening things for the Obama campaign as they watched this play out. When they did their focus groups, and they obviously didn't include people who were clearly never going to vote for the president. So these were these were people who were predisposed to like the president. And what they found was people still did like the president. They had great admiration for him as a person. They loved his family. Uh, they thought he had tried hard to do things. And a lot of them said, yes, I recognize that the Republicans are being obstructionists. They, they felt that the Republicans were being unfair to the president. But still, None, you're the president. Their view was, you're the president. You ask for this job. You're the, in a sense, father figure in this drama. You ought to be able to find a way around this. If if, if you don't have the leadership skills, then there's something wrong. And the the LBJ discussion drove some of the uh, Obama people mad. I mean, because it just kept coming up and coming up. And to be, you know, to be honest, I, I don't think LBJ could be LBJ today. I mean, the world is a lot different. It's different, yeah. Uh, he, did not, he did not operate in a time of the kind of polarization and party homogenization that we now have. But does President Obama have a leadership problem? I mean, is he better at campaigning than he is at governing? Well, he's very skillful at campaigning. He's very skillful at framing an argument. Uh, he's obviously an eloquent speaker. Uh, he is a very thoughtful person. When I talked to him uh, after the 2008 campaign, I asked him about Abraham Lincoln because uh, Lincoln obviously is his favorite president. And in describing what he liked about Lincoln, he outlined a a sort of a philosophy of leadership that I think he wanted to emulate. And as he described it, it wasn't kind of FDR or, or LBJ, you know, knocking heads and, you know, twisting arms and that. 
as he described it, it was that the truth is, you know, somewhere between you and me. And his job was to find that sweet spot where people could come together uh, and, and find that consensus. And it may be that, that that style of leadership does not fit the times in which we live. Let's talk about Mitt Romney. Did he really want to run for president? Well, he did want to run for president, but he had some doubts about, A, whether he would be the strongest candidate to take on Barack Obama in the general election, and he had some clear doubts about whether the Republican Party ultimately would warm to him to make him enthusiastically their nominee. Because he's this guy from Boston that's rich and Mormon and... Yeah, I mean, all of those things. He he said to me when I interviewed him after the election, he said his chief strategist, Stuart Stevens, said to him, this is not going to be easy winning the nomination. This is a Southern-based party, you're a Northerner. This is a very conservative party, you're a more moderate, you know, conservative, you're from Massachusetts. This is an evangelical party, you're a Mormon. You're, you're, in a sense, you've got three strikes against you starting out, and he recognized that. Now, his doubts about the general election were overcome as he watched the field assemble. I mean, he said to me, if somebody like Jeb Bush, the former Florida governor, had decided to get in the race, or some of the other people who did not run, he might not have run. He, he thought that maybe Jeb Bush would have been a, could have been a stronger general election candidate. As he saw the field as it lined up, whether it was you know, Newt Gingrich or Rick Santorum or Michelle Bachman or Herman Cain, um, I, I think he, he came to the conclusion in his own mind that he was clearly the, the class of that field uh, and would be the strongest in the general election. Let's talk about the frenzy surrounding New Jersey Governor Chris Christie. I mean, there was really a frenzy trying to get him to run. And there's, you know, these YouTube clips of him saying, I don't know how many times you want me people, you, how many different ways you want me to say no, but it's still no, I'm not running, I'm not running. What, what's going on with that? Well, he, the talk about Chris Christie running for president began almost immediately after he was elected governor in 2009. Part of that was because people could see that there were some weaknesses in the Republican field. But Christie's initial reaction was, as you describe, I'm not ready to do this. I don't want to do it. I'm not going to do it. You can ask me a hundred times, you know, what do I have to do to prove that I'm not going to do it? That carried on into 2011. And then in the summer of 2011, some heavy hitters in the Republican Party some, uh, in, in the New York area began to put pressure on him. And he was invited to come to a breakfast in New York City in the summer of 2011. As he described it to me, he believed this was going to be a relatively small and somewhat informal gathering. He said, I got there, and he said, there may have been 60 people. And instead of an informal thing, so they were lined up, you know, there were rows of chairs and they were all neatly aligned. And there was a speaker phone on a table at the front. And uh, one after another of the people in the room and some people who were, you know, out of, the, out of the city and out of the country called in and urged him to run. And he said the last person to speak was Henry Kissinger, the former Secretary of State. And he said Kissinger walked to the front of the room on his cane and turned to the group and turned to Christie and he said, I've known X number of presidents over the years. He said, the presidency is about two things. It's about courage and it's about character. He said, Governor, you have both and your country needs you. And I, I asked Governor Christie, you know, what was your reaction? And he said, you know, I was, I was almost speechless. Well, we know he's never speechless, <laughs> obviously. Uh, but he was as close to speechless as he had been. And he said, I, I stood up in front of them and I said, I don't think I'm going to run. I don't think I'm going to change my mind, but I owe it to all of you to look at this in a more serious way. And he did over a several month period. He, he talked to a lot of people. Uh, George W. Bush called him to talk about the decision making process and what it would entail if he decided to run. Didn't, in, didn't encourage him either way, but, but, but had a good talk with him. Um, in the end, he didn't, he didn't really change his mind. I think he ended up where he started out but it was a fascinating process he went through and one that he tells with great relish. Dan Baltz is in the studio with me, chief correspondent at the Washington Post and a best-selling author. The book we're discussing is called Collision 2012. You say that the Republican base, quote, remained tepid in its enthusiasm for Mitt Romney and that they were prepared to grasp at almost any shiny object that caught their eye. Herman Cain? <laughs> well, Herman Cain may have been the shiniest of those shiny objects. I mean, it's, it's, it's a little baffling in retrospect to think of how many people 
were at the top of the polls in the Republican nomination battle over a sort of 12 or 15 month period. It was almost painful to watch. It was painful because to watch. we went from Michelle Bachman, Herman Cain, Rick Perry, Newt Gingrich, everybody. It was like, who can we get that's not Mitt Romney? You had a portion of the party that was clearly for Romney. But in that early stage, it never got much above 28 or 30 or 32 percent. So that meant the majority of the party was looking elsewhere. And, you know, they would seize on, they seized on Rick Perry, who looked like central castings answer to what a Republican nominee should be. He had all the things that Mitt Romney didn't. You know, he was Southern governor, not a Northern governor. He was a real conservative, not a more moderate conservative. Uh, he was an evangelical Christian. Um, he had been in office for a dozen years. I mean, he, he had so many attributes. He turned out to be a terrible candidate, but for a time he was at the top of the polls. As he went down, the party you know, rank and file started scratching around. And so the next person to rise was Herman Cain. Now, Herman Cain is a charismatic personality. Um, he's a terrific speaker, and he had kind of perfect pitch with at least part of the Tea Party, and he had his famous 999 tax plan that appealed to a lot of people. But he was an implausible candidate to be running for president. I mean, and, and that, you know, that was exposed the longer he ran for president. He got tripped up on a number of questions. He was simply unprepared. Then came Newt Gingrich, and then Newt Gingrich got knocked down. Then came Rick Santorum, and Santorum hung in until the end. But it was as if the party, at least a good portion of the party, was going to force Mitt Romney to prove to them that he could outlast and out, you know, and outmaneuver every possible opponent. And did this bizarre primary process end up weakening Mitt Romney? I, I think it clearly did. I think that I mean, Stuart Stevens had a great line after the election. Uh, we, we were talking about the debates and kind of the damage that was done through, all, you know, 20 debates. And he said, it's a little like high school. You are who you hang out with. And by that he meant, you know, here's Mitt Romney week after week on stage with crazy people, collection of characters, <laughs> many of whom were just not ready to be president. And yet he had to fight his way through that. And so the other thing in, in you know, in a, in a policy sense was he, he moved himself to the right. I mean, he, he talked about self-deportation when they were talking about immigration, a phrase that even in retrospect he thought was benign, but it was certainly not greeted that way by the general public and not by the Hispanic community. So he clearly heard himself there. He did some things by putting out a tax plan um, that I don't think he, he, he really would have done had he not felt he needed to move to the right on economic issues because of Santorum's sudden emergence. So um, the, the primaries clearly hurt him and he had trouble moving back to the center once they were over. Do you think the the decision to choose uh, Paul Ryan as his running mate, was that a good decision? Well, you know, I, I think in the end, vice presidential nominees don't make that much difference. Except uh, Sarah Palin. Except Sarah Palin. <laughs> Although, Not to get off the subject. No, no, but I mean, but you could argue that Sarah Palin did as much good as bad because after she was picked, that race actually tightened to the point that McCain had a small lead in the polls. The, the unraveling that she that, that she did, I think he would have lost regardless of that, be that as it may. I think he picked Paul Ryan for two reasons. One was simple, basic human chemistry. He really liked Paul Ryan. He felt comfortable with Paul Ryan. When you saw the two of them on a stage together campaigning, even before he had picked him, it was just clear that th this was a more relaxed and confident Mitt Romney than when he was campaigning by himself or with some others. Some people use the term bromance. Yes, yes. <laughs> some people in, in the Romney campaign used that phrase, that it was a bromance. But the other was, um, they're both kind of numbers geeks and, and budget geeks, and they like to crunch things. I think that he felt that in picking Ryan, who was obviously not a risk-free choice because of his own budgetary blueprint, that they would be able to, to create a big debate around the issue that Romney, I think, thought would be a winning issue, was kind of the, the size of government, the spending, the debt, the deficit. Um, in the end, I don't think they were ever quite able to do that. How would you rate the performances of the two conventions? Well, the, the, there's no question in my mind that the Democrats got much more out of their convention than the Republicans got out of theirs. The Republican convention was not a bad convention, although the, the Clint Eastwood moment with the empty chair was certainly a jarring and, and uh, you know, discordant moment that was totally unplanned. But um, if you look at what the Democrats did, they did much more in terms of energizing their base 
and in terms of framing the big choice for the fall. Uh, and they got much more mileage. The book we're discussing is called Collision 2012, Obama versus Romney and the Future of Elections in America. Dan Baltz is the author. He's also chief correspondent at The Washington Post. Let's talk about the Romney's 47% comment. So he's secretly taped talking to a friendly audience, and he says that there are 47% of Americans that don't pay taxes. They feel entitled to food, health care, and housing from the government. And he says, quote, I'll never convince them to take personal responsibility for themselves. Did Mitt Romney himself realize how damaging that was? Not at the moment. Um, not, I mean, obviously not at the moment because he didn't have any idea that it was being taped. When it first came out, he didn't, he didn't get a chance to see it immediately. His immediate reaction was, well, I didn't, I didn't say what they're saying I said. Then as he finally watched it, he still had trouble accepting what he had said. And, they, and even months after the campaign, when I talked to him and, and mentioned exactly what you had said, that, the, that he had said, you know, I'll, I'll never convince them to take control of their own lives or take personal responsibility for their own lives. He said, he broke in and he said, I didn't say that. And he got up from where we were sitting and grabbed his iPad and pulled his iPad and said, I, you know, I thought we would end up talking about this and I made some notes. And he went and looked at his notes and he began to read some of the notes to me. And the reality was he had said it. I mean, it's there in the video. It's there in the transcript of it. And this isn't something you can take out of context. I mean. No, he, he I think, you know, I'm tr- trying to be a mind reader here. I, I think that whatever he n- believes came out of his mouth, he believes that, that those words did not reflect his heart and did not reflect his true feelings. I think he feels at worst that he kind of mangled things. But he does recognize and did recognize how damaging that was politically to him uh, and, and how much it hurt him. You know, I get the impression, Dan, from reading this book that it's not it's, it's whoever has the best campaign that wins. It's not the person with the best ideas. It's not the person best prepared for the presidency. It's the one that runs the better the better campaign and has the most money. Well, I would I would amend that. I mean, I think obviously uh, the best campaign generally wins, but there there is a tendency to, uh, at the end of a campaign, say that the winners always ran a great campaign and the losers, you know, were horrible. And, you know, we've seen elections that are very close, and if they'd gone the other way, you would be saying different things about it. Uh, there's no question that the Obama campaign ran a superior operation. But I think that uh, in addition to running a better campaign, the president and his team found a way to frame the choice and the argument in a way that put him at an advantage. And I mean, I also think that there were some big forces at work in the country at this election that helped Barack Obama. One is obviously the changing demographics in America. As this country has become more diverse and as the, the, the non-white share of the electorate rises with each presidential election and the white share declines by a couple of percentage points. The white share obviously is still the predominant share, but nonetheless is smaller and smaller with each, each election. The, the inability of the Republican Party to do better with non-white voters, and particularly right now with the Hispanic community, uh, is debilitating for them to win a national election, to win a presidential election. And so I think that was a big help. And also, we knew that the economy was the central issue in this campaign. And the Obama team always said our biggest, our, our most worrisome opponent is not Mitt Romney, it's the state of the economy. And it turned out that the economy was just good enough, not great, but just good enough to make it possible for him to win. You know, President Obama's aide said that he was happier with the 2012 uh, victory than he was in 2008. Why do you think that is? Well, because it was a much tougher campaign. Now, obviously, his his campaign against Hillary Clinton was an epic contest and, and one we may never see the likes of again. But um, the general election was not a particularly difficult challenge. And I think that, that this was more satisfying in part because of all he had gone through in four years in the White House. I mean, his efforts to pass legislation against the or over the opposition of the Republicans, uh, the struggles to make the economy rebound faster than it was was, and I think the sense that had he lost that election, 
as he as he put it to some people just before the election, I feel like everything's on the line here. That everything is at stake. If if he had lost that election, it certainly wouldn't have you know ended his place in history, but it would have had diminished his place in history, uh, and it it likely could have brought about the demise of many of the policies that he had put in place. Do you want to talk about 2016? <laughs> Everybody is at this point. Um, it's going to be Hillary Clinton on the Democratic side? Well, you know, it's we're so far out that, you know, if we had been here eight years ago and we talked about it, we would all say, well, it's going to be Hillary Clinton on the Democratic side. And then this fellow named Barack Obama showed up and it turned out to be a different ending to that story. Uh, having said that, I don't see anybody at this point who is the equivalent of Barack Obama kind of lurking in the shadows in the Democratic Party to challenge Even Joe her. Biden. Well, Joe Biden is a, is a known commodity. Um, he's, he's, you know, he's a very skilled politician. He is not the, the, the sort of rock star that Barack Obama was or the sense of the, the, the person who would take us into the future. I, I, I'm not convinced that uh, Vice President Biden will run if Hillary Clinton runs. I think that's a, that may be a bridge too far for him. I'm not even sure he'll run if she doesn't run. Um, and once you get past that, the, you know, the, the Democratic field is, is much less formidable. So you would have to say that she starts with huge advantages, but she had some weaknesses as a candidate, and her campaign had a lot of flaws in 2008, and she'll have to deal with that. So uh, you would have to say she, she begins this process as, uh, if she decides to run um, in a pretty strong position, but... But this far out, you know, somebody always, you know, somebody said to me long ago that the only certainty in campaigns is surprise, and uh, there will be surprises. So who's it going to be on the Republican side? It could be, uh, it could be almost anybody. They have, they have a wide open race, probably as wide open as one that we can remember in many years. Who do they, you think it's going to be? I, I have, I honestly. <laughs> Come on, Dan. <laughs> no, I, I'm, 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 I'm too scarred to uh, begin to project at this point who it's going to be. I, I honestly don't know. I think, I think the party has a choice. Or, uh, and there will be a big debate. The choice really is, do they try to find somebody who they think is, is an authentic conservative who is able to articulate the conservative philosophy in a more compelling way than either Mitt Romney or John McCain was able to do? There's a part of the party, uh, the conservative wing of the party, feels that in the sense they've not really had a standard bearer who could really do that, and they want one. So that's there will be a group of candidates who kind of trod down that direction. There will be others who say, um, and Chris Christie will clearly be one of these, we have to be able to win over people that we haven't won over. We can't win the election simply by, by appealing to our base with you know, an even more conservative message. We are a conservative party. We, we share conservative values. But we have to show that we can convert some states that have been blue states and turn them into at least temporarily, red states in 2016. That's the argument that I think you will see writ large in the Republican nomination contest. Dan Baltz, he's a best-selling author and national political correspondent at the Washington Post. The book is Collision 2012, Obama versus Romney and the Future of Elections in America. It's published by Viking. Dan, thanks so much for being on the program. Thank you, Mimi.